A very good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. And, and I know it's a busy day, so we'll try to get you out as fast as we can. So, but before we start, I want you all to do something for me, okay? It's a quick task. All right, well, I want you to take 30 seconds and think about one artifact you have enc ever encountered. Anything, did you ever encounter one? And if yes, which one? Right, I'm sure you all have at least one, you've thought about one artifact, so my goal today is to go over those basic artifacts and not just learning about the artifact, but also learn the tips on how to avoid these and how to interpret them. Sadly, I don't have any disclosures. All right, now let's take a quick look at this video. You think are all these balls moving in a circle? Can you guess which way the idol is moving? I know I'm trying to get to the point that, you know, we do make a lot of assumptions, right? Any, especially about ultrasound. We do make a lot of assumptions when it comes to physics and also when it comes to application and artifacts. So actually, these, all of them are actually moving in a straight line, believe it or not. So today, we are going to obviously talk about identifying some anatomical pitfalls, which is also very important. I think we also encounter that almost on a daily basis. So it's important for us to know these basic benign anatomical pitfalls. We are going to identify some of the ultrasound artifacts and also learn a little bit about ultrasound physics. I promise I'm not going to keep it too boring. And some tips on interpreting and avoiding these artifacts. And finally, how do we really differentiate if this is a true structure versus an artifact, right? I do have an ambitious agenda, but like I said, I promise I'm not going to go in detail with all of them, but at least we are going to cover most of these artifacts. Let's talk a little bit about ultrasound assumptions, right? So we always think sound always travels in a straight line. Is that true, right? We think that it does, but probably not, right? We also think that sound directly goes to one structure and comes back straight, right? That's another assumption we make. And then we also think that sound exactly travels in soft tissue at 15, 40 meter per second. Probably not, right? Because again, imagine the medium, imagine the propagation speed in that particular medium, so all those influence that. And also we think that reflections arise only from the structure's position in the ultrasound's beam's main axis, which is also not true. Imaging plane is thin, that's another assumption we make. And finally, we think that the strength of the reflection is related to the characteristics of the tissue which brings it on, right? Again, that's another assumption we make. Why are we talking about this, right? It's always important to apply these ultrasound physics when in doubt, right? If you think, you know, it doesn't make sense, think about, you know, the physics behind it. Is it important for clinical management? Absolutely, right? I'm sure, you know, how many of us have always thought about apical thrombi, right? You know, at least one of us, or maybe, <laughs> maybe more than one. So, you know, so definitely it's important because it can alter the clinical management. And again, remember, these can also be, if, there, if it's a true anatomy, it's always visible in all the views, right? If you think about it, you know, it's multidimensional. If there is something there which is real, then you're going to see it in multiple views. And finally, if it's not, you know, if you're not sure, you know, don't think echo first, right? Always, you know, don't hesitate to admit and go for multimodality if you have to, you know, make sure that there's nothing. And again, remember everything is in three dimension. Always think about everything you see in the third dimension as well. So now let's talk about the quick anatomical pitfalls. But I, I do want to keep this interactive, guys. So we want to step in. You know, fellows, please stop. Let's pick each and every structure and go over them. <laughs> Dr. Shah is getting you guys ready. All right. Let's see. Maybe Salim, we can pick one of your favorite structures. <laughs> <laughs> I like you too much, Salim. All right. How can we not talk about mitral valve, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, can you guess what's, is it, is it abnormal or is it normal? I mean, it looks fine. It looks fine. That's good, right? So, but you see these brighter echo densities on the tip of the valve? So, you know, what are those? 
So those are nothing. Actually, these are completely normal. They are called albini nodules. And uh, you know, when you see younger patients with very pliable valves, you can actually see the caudal insertion points. Basically, those are those brighter echo densities. So observe next time when you're seeing a very young athletic patient with completely normal valves, you can actually observe these nodules on them, right? No, no, it's just a normal caudal insertion point, but you see it more obviously. All right, let's see. Smitha. Am I done? <laughs> valves again. All right. Well, I think we are too uh, fond of valves. All right. What do you think this one is? You get a point already, Smitha. <laughs> Well, there's something there, right, here. So it's a Lambel's excrescence, right? So we do see it quite often. Again, you know, you see that, you know, it's the filiform appearance which we see on the valve itself. And again, the pathology pictures confirm that frond-like appearance. And the more important thing for this one is how do you differentiate that from a fibroelastoma, right? So fibroelastomas are actually more pathological. They are more bulky, finger-like projections. And actually, Lambel's most common at the suture lines, right? At the closure lines where you have more degeneration versus fibroelastomas can happen on any other site. So we always thought these are benign, but I should say there are some more recent data showing that they can potentially lead to embolic strokes, you know, understandably, especially if they are bigger. Treatment-wise, again, it's variable, ranging from doing nothing for the first episode versus if obviously if it's multiple episodes, you know, we talk about dual antiplatelet therapy and anticoagulation. So still way to go on this. All right, I think we are done with the valves. So let's move on to the others. HJ is going to pick one. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we take left All right. Let's see if you can identify these. Sonographers, please. You know, this one is for you guys as well, so feel free to chime in. Any guesses? The first one? I think I heard the answer. Oh, exactly. Okay, right? Yeah. And second one, what do you think? I'm going to give you some history here. It's a transplant. Oh, it's a, it's a exactly, guys. You got it. I don't think we need this lecture, Dr. Shah. <laughs> They're nailing it. All right, very important to know relevant clinical history, right, guys? So it makes a difference. So the first one here, like you said, is a prominent Coumadin ridge. We obviously see that more often on TEEs, but sometimes you can see it on transthoracic. We all know it's a benign entity. The second one here is a suture line. Obviously, the history helps in that case, right? So if you know the patient has, especially, you know, our sonographers, they give us all the history, you know, so we should give kudos to them for giving us the relevant history. But in this case, it, it would have been very relevant. All right, who's next? Priscilla. He says <laughs> ready. LV. All right. So let's take some time. I'll also show you what I'm showing. Can you guess the odd one? Yeah? Right? I think I hear the answer already. Guesses? Fourth one, right? Yeah. All right. So you got the answer, but what's not so abnormal with the others? So here's an LV tendon, actually. This is an apical LV diverticulum. This is just an apically inserted papillary muscle, like the location is more apical. And that's basically a true aneurysm, right? So important to know these guys, right? So why is it? So we all know, obviously, NV LV aneurysm usually has a wider neck, and it's typically located in the apical or the anterior walls. LV pseudoaneurysm, on the other hand, has a narrow neck with a wider base and is most often seen in the posterior or inferior walls, right? LV diverticulum, again, is a benign structure. It's just an outpouching of the LV that contains all the three layers of the myocardium, and it displays normal contraction. And of course, when you do CMR, it's very helpful because you can see that there's no enhancement in the wall of the sac or the pericardium in those cases. All right, who's next? 
Y sao? I, I, I kind of feel that you guys hate right side. We didn't pick the right side. What's that? Right atrium or right ESA. Let's see if you can guess these. Perfect. OK, I mean, that's pretty much the eustachian, right? This one is a crista terminalis. I think I heard that. Laser pointer. Oh. Is a pace of wire, right? It's a pace of wire you see in the right atrium. So I think you you guessed that right. So eustachian valve is nothing but the remnant of the sinus venosis. The second one is the crista terminalis, which is nothing but a prominent ridge between the SVC and the IVC. And the last one, again, we see it very often. It's just either a pace of wire. Sometimes you do see catheters in patients as well. All right. I think we have to repeat Salim again. Exactly, and also relevant history too, right? So if you think there's nothing else going on, obviously it's more of a benign variant. And one thing is very helpful is always looking at the previous echo, guys, right? Like, so that's one thing. Is it already there? Is it something new? That also helps in differentiating the structures. All right, Salim, you get to pick again? Right side. Right side. Let's see if you can guess these. First one. Is it in the AV group? I, I think I heard it right. Yeah, the first one is a dilated coronary sinus. What about the second one? Prominent RV moderator band. What about the last one? Perfect. Exactly, right. So, and you also see how you know the whole AV groove is calcified, right? Even the mitral annulus is calcified in this. So it's nothing but, you know, you can also actually sometimes see prominent adipose tissue in, in, on the tricuspid annular side as well. So if it's more calcified, it's more calcification. All right, I think we are done with most of it, right? I think let, let me choose the pericardial sinuses. Any takers for that? So, I mean, we often see this most commonly on TEEs. The transfer sinus is the one which is located between the aorta and the pulmonary artery, and the oblique sinus is usually located behind the left atrial appendage. And especially when there is pericardial fluid, we see these more prominently. And sometimes, let's see if you can guess this one. What's this? It's actually fat in the oblique sinus, right? So, and especially if you have fluid, you can see the fat even more prominently. And what's helpful in these patients is also looking at their overall epicardial adipose tissue, right? You are, you're also gonna see a prominent epicardial adipose fat pad. And also you can see, you know, LA, you know uh, the appendage emptying velocity will be normal in these cases. All right, I think we covered all the anatomical pitfalls. So let's talk about a little bit about thinking outside the box. See if we can guess these. What's this one, Priscilla, any take on that? Exactly, right? That's an innominate vein we are seeing. What about the second one? It's nothing but a loculated ascites. The third is the breast implant artifact, right? You see that hazy shadow all the way across the sector. 
And the last one here, I'm sure if Clara is here, she'll answer this. What's that? That's a hiatal hernia, right? You see the retroatrial shadow right here, and the patient, as they you know, ingest carbonated beverage, the hiatal hernia lights up, right? Those are, that's a hiatal hernia. All right, moving along. So we do, did cover all these anatomical pitfalls, but I do have a bonus question. Let's see if you can answer this. So what's the next step when you see something like this? Can you all see what's going on? Right? You see something on the aortic valve. Right? Let's see if one of the sonographers can pick. Perfect, Kara. Right? So additional imaging. It's obvious, okay, there is something there, but before we come, and come to conclusions, you want to do some additional imaging. And actually, if you see, this patient had a TE which showed that there's nothing on the aortic valve, right? This is a classic example of a slice artifact where you actually slice the cusp in an odd angle which actually makes it look like there's a, you know, and we have actually had more than a couple of cases. So very important. So what, what do you do for additional imaging? I think it's important to be specific. If you see something like this, what do you do? <laughs> Biplane, right? Biplane, definitely. Or you scan through it because if it is a slice artifact, if it is a slice artifact at the bottom of the cusp, if you do a long axis of this view or a biplane, you won't see a mass. You, know, you won't see a cardiac mass. You will. I'm not shouting at this. <laughs> so the question was. Sonographer gets that, or the interpreting physician gets this. It's a slice artifact at the bottom of the cusp. Remember what the cusp looks like, it has a round kind of shape. And also at the same time, right? See, in systole it goes away. You know why? Because the heart descends in systole. So you're not anymore at the bottom of the cusp. In diastole it goes up. So you have to kind of think that the heart is moving while you're imaging it, right? So you scan, you do a little sweep just to see whether indeed there is something there, but more importantly, you go in a perpendicular plane, either dedicated parasternal long or a biplane view, right? Yeah. Got it. All right, going back to our original topic of ultrasound artifacts, right? So we're going to talk quickly about 2D artifacts. But before that, let's talk about principles of sound, right? So let's think about what happens when sound encounters an object or strikes a specular interface. What are the possibilities, right? So one, it re gets reflected back at the same angle of incidence. The angle of reflection is the same as the angle of incidence. Or if it hits it at 90 degrees, it can go straight back up. Right? That's one possibility. That's basically reflection. What's the second possibility? Right? It goes straight through or it gets transmitted, depending on the propagation you know, uh, speed of the sound in that medium. Or what, what else can happen? It can bend or get refracted. Again, it depends on the speed of sound in that medium. And finally, it can be scattered. Right? Scatter is actually the one which is important because it's caused by those poor reflectors and it actually increases with increasing frequency of the ultrasound. So the backscatter is the portion which actually returns to the transducer and that's the one which is valuable for imaging. So why are we talking about that? Basically because all our artifacts are based on that, those principles of ultrasound. Let's talk a little bit about 2D or basic ultrasounds. I know we have some fancy names, but these are names, but what's more important is to understand the mechanism and also tips on avoiding them. Right, so we have reverberation or comet tail or ring down artifact, and then we have shadowing and enhancement artifacts. Then we have multipath or mirror image artifact, refraction or ghost image artifact, side lobe artifact, beam width, and range ambiguity. Like I said, these are names, but again, important to understand the mechanism behind these. Let's talk a little bit about reverberation or multipath artifact. So it's nothing but when there are two specular interfaces, when the waves basically hit multiple times, let me explain this to you even better. So imagine you're sending a wave, 
You know, it hits the interface and then comes back and then it creates an image, right? Imagine if this happens again. If it's a very strong reflector, it does that again, right? You see the second image. And imagine if it happens again, you're going to see a third image, right? Which one is the real one here? The original one, you know, is the real image versus the others are the reverberation artifacts, right? So mainly happens when you have a very strong, you know, one which in the interface is a super reflector. So remember, the key thing in this one is artifacts are always farther than the original reflector and also at multiples of the original distance. You see here the distance is actually, you know, the multiple of the original distance from the reflector. And again, remember, they don't follow anatomical boundaries. They are actually, you know, most, most of the times they are, you know, they follow beyond the anatomical boundaries. And they all move in parallel, right? Because they are related to the original reflector as well. And again, for boards, for the fellows, I mean, when you hear the term stepladder, that's again a, a, a term for reverberation artifact as well. How do you avoid these? That's more important, right? So obviously you change the imaging plane, you actually change the gain, and you can also change the TGC if you want to, right? So all that can help. Let's see if you can see what's going on here. So the first one here, you see that classic stepladder pattern? That's one type of artifact. And here you see it looks like a plural effusion, but it's actually a reverberation artifact. And sometimes it can also happen on TEEs, right? If the back wall of the left atrium is very reflective, it can actually falsely produce a flap-like thing in the iota, which, is, which mimics iodic dissection. So very important to know this concept when you're doing TEEs as well, and especially if you're evaluating for dissection, remember to make sure you're throwing biplane, throwing color Doppler, and also looking in, in the other views as well. Now what is this one? We see this very often in, in, you know, in cases with mechanical valves. So not, that's nothing but a comet tail or a ring down artifact. It happens when the closely spaced reverberations are merged and they create that uniform shadow. And see this, in this case, they, the bright echo density you see behind the highly reflective mechanical valve there, right? What is acoustic shadowing? So when you see an hypoechoic or an anechoic region, mainly from the structure which is very reflective, and it's again, it's almost caused the entire signal you see, there is a space behind it. Like for example here, there's a dense mitral annular calcium, and if you look at the arrow, that's the acoustic shadowing caused by the annular calcium, right? And you can see in the mechanical lab, this is that enhancement we saw, and if you see the stars, that's the acoustic shadowing. So it happens quite often, actually. What's enhancement? It's exactly the opposite of what we saw. When you have a region of low attenuation and when you see brighter echo densities at the bottom, that's basically echo acoustic enhancement. And this is also, you know, most of the times when you have fluid-filled structures, you can have this artifact right behind them. I'm pretty sure you're going to think why is it related, but we're going to talk about that soon. All right, that's a mirror image artifact. I wanted you to remember the term, that's why I played that. Again, as you see here, it always results in duplication of what we are seeing, right? And if you see, you know, it re always results in a structure deeper than reality. And again, artifacts are always deeper, guys. Remember that. The true structures are the ones which are more closer. And true reflector and artifact, again, are at equal distance. And here are a few examples. You see how it's moving in parallel with the heart suggesting that's an artifact, and same here, you see actually duplication of the color as well. What happens if you put the pulse doppler where you see the color? You can go back. Where that arrow is, where the green arrow is, if you put a pulse doppler, do you have a signal or no signal? No signal? That's what I hear. I hear reverberations of a no signal. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? You're going to have a signal. You'll have the same signal. Well, why do you think you're seeing color Doppler? That's Doppler, right? So 
you will see the same thing. And this is a beautiful example. And clinically, by transthoracic, where do you see this most of the time? Any? Where do you see this? I mean, here you have an aorta, looks like, and where do you see it most of the time? Descending aorta. Yes, descending aorta, supra, I mean, your suprasternal imaging, looking at the descending aorta, and this is the concern is that you may suspect that this is a dissection because you're going to see two lumens and you're going to see blood outside. Not blood, but artifact or reverberation, right? So be careful about that. Yeah, very important clinically, guys. Actually, we think, you know, uh, you know, we think about this topic as more based on physics, but I think it has a lot of clinical relevance. Like, say, let's see if you can guess this one. <laughs> well, you guessed it, that it's an artifact. Right? So it's actually a refraction artifact. I think somebody already said that. So what's different in this? Basically, it's the change of direction, right? The reflection of the sound in a different direction is basically a refraction. Again, it alters the beam direction, so system obviously assumes that it's a straight line, but if you see, it places a duplicate image right in that direction, right? That's also called as a ghost image artifact, and if you see, you know, the actual object position is here versus you see the reflected image on the other side. So it actually creates in the same, you know, plane, the, the second image. Let's see if you can guess this one. Which one of these is an artifact, A or B? This one, these three, the lower bottom three are one case, which is the B, and the upper one is case A. Actually none, you know? And this is why I think relevant clinical history is again important. The case one is actually a case of a retained guide wire in the descending iota, and case B is actually an unfortunate scenario where the patient actually ended up getting the pacemaker in the left ventricle. You know, unfortunate situation, uh, but it did happen. So, you know, very important to know relevant clinical history too. All right. I'm sure it's a, a case from elsewhere. <laughs> yeah, it was not a Methodist case, let me say that. <laughs> All right, so what is a side lobe artifact? I'm sure we have encountered that as well multiple times, right? So when you have an ultrasound beam that produces multiple weaker beams adjacent to the main beam, that's when you can see this, right? It can be out of plane because the, the, whatever is reflecting doesn't have to be in the same plane as the original reflector. And this one, if you see, this is one classic example. I think, you know, I've remembered, you know, being called, oh, is the pacemaker, you know, now in the LV, is it protruding? But actually, no, you know, it, it's just a side lobe artifact from the strongly, you know, specular reflector. In this case, it's actually an example where a calcified sinotubular junction can actually produce like a falsely, you know, like false lumen and look like it's an aortic dissection as well. So important to know these concepts when you're interpreting, right? Bottom line is how to avoid. Decrease your gain, add biplane, add color, make sure whatever you're seeing is consistent in all the views. I think you know, all of our sonographers do a good job in that, especially when they see you know, it's suspicious of a flap. And like I said always, if you're in doubt, don't hesitate. Approach multimodality if we have to. But you know, it's always to make sure that it's clinically explained as well. All right, what is this one, guys? I think I've already put that there. It's a beam width artifact caused by a dilated iota. If you see there is a duplication of the shadow right next to the interatrial septum, it's basically catching the dilated iota from the elevational plane, right? And right, let's, let's see if you can answer this question. What do we do when you see this? Any guesses? Right? I think you got it. So it's change the imaging depth, alter the transducer location. But what is the artifact here? Can you guess? That's the range ambiguity artifact, actually. 
So imagine when you're sending a beam and there are two events happening, right? And the, and the ultrasound doesn't know, right? You're getting both the signals back and sometimes it can mismatch or cross-process the, whatever the information it has. And that's when you, you get that range ambiguity artifact. And the clue actually is, see that, how it looks like floating image? So that's the clue. You, know, it can, you, you see it actually persists through the color Doppler as well. So when it almost looks like it's floating out of the plane, that's when you should think about this artifact. So finally, what are the most important clues, right? So real structures obviously have distinct edges versus artifacts are obviously, you know, way beyond, they don't have well demarcated borders. And real structures always have independent motion and they concur with the cardiac cycle versus artifacts don't, right? They don't usually, uh, you know, have separate motion. They move with the reflector. And real structures always attach to the other structures, follow anatomical boundaries versus artifacts don't have that, right? And also, real structure is real. You see it in all the views. You see it no matter what you do. Artifacts can sometimes disappear, right? Just based on how you do the imaging. So important thing to remember. And again, put everything in the clinical context, right? You still get it, you know, make sure you're looking at the clinical context as well. All right, let's quickly move on to color Doppler artifacts. So whatever is happening on 2D can happen on color Doppler as well. Important thing is to recognize color gain, you know, importance, and also a little bit about ghosting and aliasing. So here you clearly see a reverberation artifact which is reflecting on the color as well. This one is the mirror image artifact which Dr. Zogby was just describing. This one here is a refraction artifact which happens on color as well. And finally, I'm sure we've all seen this. This is when you have a very thickened and calcified iodic valve, right? It causes like that, you know, puff of, you know, multiple colors, which is basically a ghosting artifact. Let's see if any of the sonographers can guess this. Rita, what's wrong with this? Yeah, exactly, right. So I think very important to recognize this too, right? So in this case, the color gain is too low. In this case, it's actually high. How do you set it? Obviously, every time you turn on the machine, I always tell, you know, make sure you're checking the color gains, you know, increase it to a level where it's speckling and then bring it down to the optimal level. So whenever you see something which doesn't make sense and it's happening in every view, that's when you go back and reset, reset your color gain settings. This one is here, a twinkling artifact. And this one here is actually a flash artifact. You know, it's actually a pseudo flow. It almost looks like there's a false flow. And this one here, we, again, we see this one quite often too, is actually when we have electronic noise from devices. When we have impeller and all that, sometimes you can see that. All right, let's move on to spectral Doppler artifacts. Again, whatever is happening on 2D can happen on spectral Doppler as well. So you have all those artifacts and this one here, this is overgain, right? You can see that, and this one is undergained, right? So why is it important, right? We miss relevant information if the gain is under, and all, we overestimate everything if the gain is over. What about this one? This is actually the beam width artifact of the spectral Doppler. So if you sample too large of a sample volume, what happens? In addition to whatever we are interest, you know, we are, our interesting one is, you're gonna get all the other noise from the other structures as well. So you see here is actually an AR signal on top of the mitral inflow. What's this one? Those are device-related artifacts, right? So the first one here is an LVAD, and this one is an impeller, which is creating those alternate bands. So look out for those artifacts as well. So this one is actually spectral mirroring or crosstalk, where you actually see you know, flow on both directions, right? Again, you know, the brighter signal is the true one, and the, in the less brighter signal is the false one, right? This one, again, is a blossoming artifact. And this one here, how many of you know about wall filter saturation? Right? I'm sure all the sonographers know about it. It's very important to know, because when you're really trying to sample those low velocity flows and you want to eliminate those unwanted signals, you probably want to change your wall filters. I'm sure all of us can relate, and some of us even more so. What is this one? There are cases when we did TEEs and we see those double reflection artifacts or mitral valve double envelope, right? 
So it's actually a clear case of artifact. I know there was a Twitter war about it, about is it really an artifact or is it the hydraulic forces which is causing it? But they proved it by doing a, a case where they saw the double envelope and they decreased the gains and, and the uh, you know, artifact was gone. So very important to know this because which one do we really measure? Because that changes clinical management. So the denser inner shadow is the one which we actually have to measure. All right, I think we had enough with 2D and color. Now, do you think artifacts happen on 3D? Yeah, right? So whatever happened on 2D and color can actually happen on 3D as well. So you can actually have acoustic enhancement. You see those brighter signals on 3D. This is a blooming artifact from very dense annular calcium. Here you actually have a dropout artifact. You know, sometimes when there is the angle of the ultrasound is odd, you can actually have dropouts. And this one here is a stitching artifact. I'm sure all of you know when we do multi-beat acquisition in an irregular rhythm, you're gonna have that stitching artifact. And here it's actually a railroad artifact from a very thick lumen catheter. All right, do we have time for bonus questions? I'll make it really short, because I do want to leave some time for Dr. Pasha. That's a slice thickness artifact, guys. See this? It almost looks like there is a jet right here, but that's actually a PR jet you're catching from a different elevation, right? Very important. What do you think about this one? I'll say that there was a ball and cage there, but why don't you see it? It's because of the slow and smooth motion. It's actually a velocity error artifact. And finally, this one here. See, there is a, something here and there's mitral leaflets here. This is one of those fabulous cases by Dr. Lowry where actually the native leaflets were left over after a bioprosthesis placement. So those are actually the native leaflets. All right, guys, so I think, so always remember, common sources of error and misinterpretation True anatomy, always visible in multiple views. Explain based on the principles of applied physics. And no key points on how to avoid these, important when you're acquiring these images. Coming soon, ASC guidelines on, our, on artifacts are coming out, so stay tuned. And finally, something fishy, always consider artifact, and if you have to approach multimodality, you can. <laughs> All right, thank you guys. for a uh, very uh, comprehensive uh, talk about uh, echo artifacts and now I've been tasked to talk about uh, CMR and CT related artifacts and let me see whether this one projects whoops I guess that's the other way of doing it uh. all right so uh, is this moving or is this an artifact uh, I will let you guess but uh, obviously this is a stationary object and uh, it's our eye that's giving us a delusion that these circles are moving. So starting with Cardex CT and mentioning a little bit about motion or blurring artifact, which is the most common artifact we see. Uh, and the motion can be either from the uh, heart itself, cardiac, or the coronary arteries, which are moving during various phases of the cardiac cycle. A regular heart rate could be a factor versus fast heart rate versus arrhythmias, especially atrial arrhythmias. Uh, respiratory uh, motion could also introduce another source of artifact. 
And as we remember, uh, the images are acquired during diastasis, which is basically the period of the cardiac cycle which has the least motion because of our limited uh, temporal resolution, which is why we do use uh, beta blockers. Uh, so when we talk about the coronary arteries, this is a diagram that shows you the velocity on the y-axis and the phases in the cardiac cycle on the x-axis, depicting here in different colors the LAD, the RCA, and the circumflex. Obviously, in slow heart rate, we do acquire images in mid to late diastole. So this usually corresponds to 70 to 80% of the RR interval right before the atrial kick, because as you can see here over the P wave, you have a very sharp rise in those coronary velocities. But there is another phase in the cardiac cycle where coronaries also have less motion, and this is during the isovolemic relaxation time, which is around 30 to 40% of the RR interval. And really, what we want to achieve is basically a motionless right coronary artery, which has the highest velocity among all uh, uh, coronary segments. This is basically on an axial uh, stacks on coronary CTA. What you would see is motion in the right coronary artery. You're going to get to see this winging or black hole uh, on this right coronary artery. And this is how I know that the coronary motion did occur during this phase. And why is that? Because when we acquired images in this particular case, the RR interval was variable, and we were acquiring images at 450 milliseconds, which did correspond to that atrial kick. And if I actually have chosen a different phase of the cardiac cycle here, the same coronary, but at 350 milliseconds, so right at that uh, uh, end systole, uh, during the isovolemic relaxation time, I now can interpret this segment of the right coronary artery, which was not interpretable uh, on the different uh, phase of the cardiac cycle. Sometimes what you can see with motion artifact, you can see a break in those coronary lines. So you can see here the right coronary artery, there's almost a line of interruption. And that's basically what motion artifact would look like. This is a case basically on an axial stacks. What you see actually, there is almost kind of double shadowed in the appendage, double shadow in the aorta, double shadow in the uh, left atrium, in the heart. And this is basically typically what we see is a rhythmia artifact, meaning that the period when we acquired those images were in different uh, RR cycles that are not uh, uh, cohesive. So you can see here the double shadow in the left atrial wall, uh, the double shadow in the aorta, because this patient was an atrial flutter uh, during the time of the examination, which basically introduced this cardiac motion artifact. Um, this is basically a case where we can see misregistration or step artifacts. So when we acquire multiple uh, uh, scans during uh, different cardiac cycles, typically every other heartbeat, what you can sometimes basically see is that the artery just moves out of phase. So we do develop basically uh, a misregistration when we're trying to stitch these data together. I actually do notice that I have a uh, 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 quote, quote, quote unquote a step artifact that basically can render the segment not interpretable because I can see the segment before but after, but right on this stage over here, I basically have this registration uh, artifact or what people call step artifact. This is exactly what you see, those latter steps uh, across the ascending aorta, across the pulmonary artery and the RV outflow tract. And one of the solutions to kind of resolve this is using wide coverage detectors or volumetric scanners. There are a couple of them out there that give you a wide Z-axis coverage or basically using the high pitch scanner, which basically called flash by Siemens and this basically gets you a single beat acquisition because I no longer need to <coughs> I no longer need to stitch the data or acquire data in multiple cycles. I can get the whole data in a single uh, heartbeat. If the patient took a breath during the examination, you're going to see this line in the sternum. So this break in the sternum can render the coronary segment blurry. And this is basically what breathing motion artifact would look like. Always uh, our techs practice breath holding with patients, not only to see how long they can hold their breath, but what their heart rate would do during the breath holding. And obviously if we use a single beat acquisition or a high pitch scanning mode like the flash, we are able to minimize the breath holding duration uh, for the patient down to uh, almost two seconds using these new uh, scanning modes. Uh, this is basically another uh, wild uh, ladder step artifact that really kind of makes your test really not interpretable. Um, uh, in metals, uh, we can actually get something called streak artifacts. And the basic mechanism behind it is that there are different uh, uh, energies through those X-ray uh, beams that are transmitted through the patient. The low energy one gets attenuated and weakened. And as a result, you actually get a 
higher weighted average of the remainder of those x-rays. So that's why they typically, they create some sort of hardening artifact. So some people call it beam hardening or blooming artifact. Typically, if it's the x-ray is facing a metallic object like a clips, a wire, a stent, calcification, or any region with high contrast density. So this is basically a stent in the LAD. And what you can see inside the stent, there is basically a beam hardening artifact, almost creating some sort of a low signal uh, intensity. And now with uh, most of the scanners, they do have this uh, post image uh, uh, reconstruction filters that actually allow you to see what's inside the stent and basically avoid these uh, beam hardening artifacts. This is a patient with a mechanical mitral valve and you can see these streaks coming out from the struts uh, of this valve. Uh, and this is basically uh, the same uh, artifact that you can see in pacemaker wires. This is a patient who has a biventricular ICD. A lot of those artifacts are basically seen uh, uh, on cardiac CT. Um, Excessive calcification can also cause this beam hardening, or some people call it blooming. And this is actually the Achilles heel of CT imaging because it's actually a blooming so much that I cannot see what is inside the vessel. And the basic theory behind it is what we call partial volume averaging. So the tissue that you are image has uh, a 3D voxel, which is basically a pixel in the X and Y and Z axis. And what happens is that there is uh, uh, a weighted average of all the uh, attenuation that occurs across this voxel. And if I have an area that has a higher attenuation versus a lower attenuation, it is actually gonna try to average out all that volume, which is why calcium will take not one pixel, but it might take two or three other adjacent pixels, which is why it might actually make you not able to see what is inside uh, uh, the calcium because of the volume averaging that occurs. Uh, CT noise, all what it is, it's basically low photon count CT. You can see actually over here, uh, uh, you don't really have a nice uh, image. It's very noisy. You have a low signal to noise ratio, typically in obese patients. And one of the solutions that can be done over here is you can increase the tube voltage, bearing in mind that it can come at the expense of increasing radiation. Increasing slice thickness will also tend to improve your signal to noise ratio, but lower your spatial resolution and using soft uh, reconstruction uh, filters. Uh, for the next 10 minutes, we're going to cover some of the MRI uh, artifacts, and uh, these are the main categories that we come across. Uh, motion from either patient or respiratory motion, uh, gating artifact, because almost all of our cardiac scans are ECG gated. Uh, we could also have physiological artifact that could be related to flow or motion, hardware, and some inherent physics uh, artifacts that we're going to come across. These are some of the few helpful resources uh, to basically look at uh, because we really cannot cover everything in five or ten minutes, uh, especially talking about all the uh, physics behind these uh, artifacts. Whenever you basically, this is a cine uh, SSFP uh, at the level of the mitral valve, you can see this motion in the abdominal uh, uh, organs. This is really how you can diagnose breathing artifacts. Obviously, I need to be able to uh, acquire images at a shorter period of time, and one of the things that can be done is reducing the number of case space lines. Uh, or segments. The other thing is that you can also uh, increase the number of lines or volumes per second per cardiac cycle. This will uh, unfortunately affect your uh, resolution. And lastly is basically using what we call real-time acquisition if the patient is not able to hold their breath uh, uh, because of long acquisition time. So gating artifact, basically we do know that in MRI we acquire data in a segmented fashion, so meaning that they are uh, uh, data that are acquired and bins that are filled over multiple cardiac cycles. And this is basically what we do. Uh, between the R and R interval, we actually create and fill lines of data by creating those bins. Typically, we get anywhere between 25 to 30 phases uh, uh, of cardiac cycle per image uh, uh, um, uh, or per cine image, uh, to put it that way. And you can see here that with every uh, a period of the cardiac cycle, I'm actually acquiring and filling lines of data that starts to build up. So these images are acquired retrospective over a multiple cardiac cycles. This is in contrast to what we call a prospective gated acquisition where we trigger over the R wave and usually there is a trigger delay before we acquire the images. And then before the second R wave, we actually stop acquiring and then we acquire images uh, uh, typically uh, during the uh, window that we set uh, at the scanner. 
Uh, this is a case actually where uh, the patient was having a lot of arrhythmias, uh, tachyarrhythmias, and this basically can make your image extremely noisy. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, it might affect your volumetric assessment for heart function. But one of the things in, in this patient with atrial fibrillation using a retrospective gating versus a prospective gated acquisition, notice how significantly I've lessened my noise and my signal to noise ratio has improved. But because of the omission of the diastolic image, you might actually underestimate the volumes, uh, but you're probably gonna still get a decent ejection fraction because it's happening on both diastolic and systolic images. Uh, one of the other artifacts that we also see is what we call a phase wrap artifact or aliasing artifact. And this happens when parts of the body outside of the field of view are wrapped around the opposite side of the image. And this usually occurs when the field of view is smaller than the spatial extent of your uh, uh, pulse excitation. One of the solutions that can be done is typically you can increase your field of view rather than keeping it smaller. Or the second thing is that you can simply phase encode in the shortest anatomical direction. So for example, over here, between head to foot and right to left, obviously the right to left has a much wider distance and this is exactly what you see over here with a wrap artifact. You can see here there's a skin folding that's basically starting to grow over the uh, RV outflow tract on this cine image. And exactly what we were talking about, if you phase encode in the shortest dimension, this is gonna be a right to left has a wider coverage than if you go anterior to posterior. And here, if you phase encode in the anterior posterior direction, you actually avoid this uh, wrap artifact that you see over here on the left image, but it completely goes away uh, on the right image without affecting your field of view. Uh, and light gadolinium enhancement, we can also see uh, wrap artifacts, and these wrap artifacts can unfortunately introduce an area of high signal intensity, but these are not scar tissue or gadolinium enhancement, but this is basically exactly what we see, this wrap artifact uh, from the uh, smaller field of view that we have over here. Uh, with uh, um, um, a single shot, I'm sorry, with uh, the steady state uh, SSFP uh, sequences, we can actually have banding artifacts, and this basically occurs whenever um, acquiring multiple uh, images during multiple repetition times, there is actually a lot of dephasing that occurs of these spins because they are subject within the magnetic field. So the stronger the magnetic field, the more likely I'm gonna see those artifacts. And one of the things basically that we can alleviate this field inhomogeneity is basically by prescribing uh, uh, shimming coils in the region of interest, which in our case is basically the heart. And the second thing is we can lower our repetition time in order to avoid this excessive uh, spin dephasing. So this is basically what you see over here, are, uh, these dark band artifacts, and usually it occurs in areas where there is a high uh, signal intensity near the edges uh, of the field of view. Oh, I thought the, the cursor is not showing up. Oh, I'm sorry, here it is. Uh, this is what the artifact I'm, I'm pointing to. It doesn't really show. Oh, you have to look at it over here. Okay, this is the artifact in this area over here. <clears throat> now this is a patient with a, uh, a bicuspid uh, uh, aortic valve and what you see actually here on this um, uh, steady state free precession sequence on CINE that there is basically flow artifact. So this is actually not uncommonly seen uh, and some of the uh, uh, solutions in order to try to decrease this is basically using a different uh, uh, um, uh, image acquisition sequence. In this case we've actually used a spoiled uh, gradient recoil echo so you can see basically now less artifact uh, that's happening because of the flow. And other ways actually to resolve that is to try to uh, increase your bandwidth or reduce your repetition time. But at the same time, if I acquire less number of segments, I might actually uh, uh, decrease the pulsatility of that flow uh, that you see. This is actually here is a signal loss uh, that you see uh, from the blood flowing into the pulmonary veins. This is the left atrium over here. This is the short axis aortic valve and this is the uh, tricuspid valve. And we do see, as we said, with a higher magnetic field strength, like for example in 3 Tesla, you're actually, uh, will be able to, you'll see more of these shading or banding artifacts that almost always occur in the uh, SSFP, which is the one that has the uh, worse, uh, uh, well not worse, but more susceptible to any magnetic field inhomogeneity. Now during uh, past perfusion, uh, uh, um, uh, and, um, magnetic resonance imaging, so this is basically for ischemia evaluation, you could actually see this uh, small uh, uh, pixel of uh, dark rim, or some people call it the Gibbs artifact, and it's not entirely sure why does this happen, but there are some theories that it might be related to the partial volume averaging, 
at the area between high contrast and less contrast, which is blood myocardial interface. There's also could be some susceptibility uh, artifact in here. But usually this does not last more than three to five cycles. In this case, you can see that these areas that are black, they go away. But this area that actually appears uh, uh, more hypodense, this is, looks like a true perfusion defect rather than an artifact because it's a little bit more dense. And number two, it actually lasts beyond certain cardiac cycles. So this is, in one image, you can actually detect what a false positive perfusion defect is versus a true uh, perfusion defect is on this first pass perfusion uh, imaging. Uh, ion basically will cause perturbation uh, in your magnetic field. It will affect all your relaxation times of the heart. So this is basically what you see is the magnetic off resonance artifact because of ion overload in the liver. And you can see all this uh, uh, quote unquote artifactual lines uh, because of that. This is a patient with uh, sternotomy wires and usually they cause what we call the susceptibility artifact. There are no hydrogen atoms uh, in, in, in wires or metals. So that's basically exactly what you see. Uh, the MR scanner and patients who've had pacemaker generators, you're basically going to see a lot of uh, uh, artifact from the pacemaker generator. And the closer it is to the chest wall or to the heart, thankfully in this case, it was not affecting my cardiac assessment, but sometimes it could be basically be lowered down in the chest and can cause significant loss of your cardiac field of view. Uh, some ghosting artifacts we see on, uh, on late gadolinium enhancements. So you can see this line over here uh, on this uh, uh, four chamber view. And you could also see uh, another line uh, projecting somewhere over here in this area. And these, if they are occurring uh, because of heart rhythm abnormalities, they're only gonna affect the cavity. But if these artifacts, which are ghosting artifacts, they occur because the patient did take a breath in, then usually you're gonna see the ghosting st starts at the adipose tissue and extends. So you can see here, this starts at the adipose tissue and extends. So this is more likely to be a breathing motion artifact. Uh, for the sake of time, uh, I'm going to try to kind of uh, talk about the chemical shift artifact in the last two minutes. And what happens is that um, the hydrogen protons in both water and fat, they will process or resonate, but at different frequencies, usually around 3.5 uh, parts uh, 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 per million. And what happens is that these uh, uh, processing, uh, processing uh, fat and water molecules, what can happen is that during the same uh, position where they are at, they might actually have different frequencies. So meaning that they are rotating, but there is a very slight difference in that rotation speed. And uh, with time, what happens is that they are actually cancel each out, cancel each other, because although they are located at the same position, one would have a positive frequency, the other one would be in the opposite direction. And that's exactly what you see actually over here. So you see basically here at the, inter at the interface, between uh, the epicardial fat along with the pericardial fluid, you can basically see this quote unquote one pixel of low uh, uh, density uh, um, um, uh, intensity. And that's exactly what the chemical shift uh, artifact, usually at the interaction between fat and water. Uh, so really in, to conclude, uh, knowledge, having enough knowledge about the appearance of artifacts is essential because we are gonna see them whether an echo or CT or MRI and altering the scan uh, preparation and the parameters can basically help uh, uh, avoid these to avoid misinterpretation. And with that, I would like to conclude and thank you for your attention. These are very important, otherwise you can be fooled. Thank, Thank you. you. So, Mohammed, I have a quick question for you. Yeah. Um, one, both you and Bindu did a great job. Uh, you mentioned for the calcification artifact that you get from CT, and is that just partial volume, or is there more than partial volume involved causing a blooming? Because partial volume should only be one pixel. Uh, I think the, the rationale is, um, Remember, in, in calcium, because some of them have a much higher Hounsfield unit compared to the contrast. So contrast will have a Hounsfield unit of 300, but calcium will have Hounsfield unit in the thousands. So there is a lot of ultra, a lot of X-ray energy that's being attenuated. So that's going to worsen that, number one. But number two, the reason why inside the calcium you'll have hard time to visualize is because of uh, severe partial, partial volume averaging. Uh, but on top of that, you basically have the different tissue properties or attenuation, far more with calcium compared with contrast, which is why it just adds to the, um, to the uh, artifact itself. 
All right. Thank you. Thank you.